computer. The purpose of recording the lecture is twofold. One, um, in case you want to review some of the material, you can do that. And the other is in case you miss the uh, session, you can go online and take a look at it. Um, I set up a YouTube class. I didn't record the actual YouTube link for it, but if you go to YouTube and search for AGFM 2131, you should be able to find the first lecture. I've posted the first lecture up there. Um, ignore the first 20 minutes. It's really awful because I didn't know how to do the share screen selection like this morning i didn't know how to log into the college zoom session i forgot there's a special procedure i had to log in with my credentials I figured it out after about 10 minutes so that's why i'm starting a bit late this morning um okay before i carry on with the lecture and ask for people with questions. Um, just a reminder, every week I'll be asking a couple of people questions just to start off the class. And the, these people will be kind of my um, people I can call out in case there's a question that you know I'd like answered. And um, oftentimes the questions are open to everybody, but I'll ask questions for specific people initially. Uh, there's another person to admit. Okay, so uh, Jayun Bay, uh, Hamish Brown, Cassandra Carr, Irene Cloma, Matthew Cox, I think, or Cor, Matthew Cor, Matthew anyway. And Tobach um, those are the six of you. Um, and I see. Don's posted a message about half paying attention. A, so posting a YouTube video online might be very useful. Uh, and Paul is asking, what is the YouTube link? Let me just, I'll just go to YouTube and find it. And post it right here. EGFM 2131. The title of the YouTube page is AGFM 2131DC. Oh, this is a direct message to Tabuchku. Tabuchku. Hmm. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, I want a direct message to everybody. There, that's better. <laughs> And lecture one. Here it is. I think there's a link to the very first YouTube lecture. Okay. I think I asked for questions from you guys. And Don, you've already subscribed to the YouTube channel. Great. So uh, anybody else have any other questions, comments?
my policy on students missing lab due to weather? Ah, it's a great question due to the weather today, huh? Um, okay, so if the college is open, here's the thing. Um, lab will run as scheduled. And what I have are 11 labs over the course of the semester. Um, and it can change with every year. Uh, some labs I've run, some years I've run less, some years I've run uh, way less. And what happens is if there's a day where it's like today and Durham College closes campus, um, that lab is just removed from the grading and I'm not too sure if we, we just move everything back one week. It'll depend on um, the technician and what her, uh, uh, what she's prepared for the week after. I would have to talk to her about what is going on the next week. Um, and over the course of the year, if uh, you miss one lab, what happens is I drop your lowest grade. So if there's 11, le 11 labs and you miss one because you can't get out of the driveway, which is understandable, or it's unsafe on the highways or roads, um, you, you get one lab that you can miss. And it, it's not going to be counted against you if it's like a day like today and the lab is closed. Um, we're going to just have one less lab over the course of the year. That's kind of what um, goes on when we miss a lab. What campus do labs take place on? And that would be Durham College's, oh, you'll see at the end of today's lecture, I've got a picture of the entrance. It's the North Campus. That's where everybody goes for the microbiology lab. Okay, and speaking of the lecture, let's correct, Oshawa Campus, Simcoe Street up at the north of um, Conlon and Simcoe. So last week I had difficulty sharing a screen. This week, let's see if I can do this a little easier. So everybody, I have the PowerPoint up. You should be able to see lecture two. If I've done this right, you have lecture two on your screen. If I can get a, yes, I can see that. Uh, th that's your first question. Um, Jayun and Hamish, one of you two, can I see it? Oh, and Danielle can see it. William says yes, Danielle says yes, great, okay. Hamish, Jayun. How about you guys? Hamish says yes. All right. Thanks, Hamish. Okay, so let's just take a look at the first slide. And cursor's here. Click review. So last week, I I'll just start off with some questions. There were three descriptions of the word vehicles for the transference of microbes. Um, give me one or two of these vehicles. So this is going out to Jayun, Hamish, and Cassandra. Give you three the question.
And I see Robert's given the answer, vectors. Um, a vector could be a vehicle, I think. Um, but we're looking more for water, air, food. And Cassie's also got the question. Good. OK, so that's correct. Let's kick, carry on. Let's see the answer. Click. Oh, I've deleted the answer. Oh, no. Oh, well. Uh, you do get the right answer, Cass. Food, water, air. That's right. Next slide. Explain what is meant by the phrase disease vector. So what is a disease vector? June, you joined us just perfectly on time. Um, this question can go to you. Cassandra, Irene, Hamish. Robert's got an answer, which is close. Irene's closer. Biological organisms that carry ma uh, pathogens mechanically or biologically. This is the kind of a bit more scientific answer to the um, answer to the question. Correct. So if an organism is carrying disease from one place to another, that would be called a vector. And question, last question on this page, how would the following diseases spread? And I've got a pair decline, photoplasm, and in the first picture is a pair of silid citrus greening, also known as Asian citrus silid, uh, potato zebra chip disease, and this is carried by the potato silid. Um, so what do these flies do to carry the disease and transfer and emit the disease? What kind of uh, example of vector is that? And you can see my image here. Uh, let's see, where's the annotate tool? Do a spotlight. You can see here's a insect. They lay eggs. Whoops. The eggs develop. And they become larger till they become full size. But um, what happens inside is the eggs transmits the disease into the phloem and the phloem transmits the disease to the rest of the plant. And what happens then is your oranges become green unevenly or your potatoes become looking like uh, zebras because the disease affects the outside color of the uh, plant. Cass says it's an insect vector and we'll say that's correct. Yep, thanks Cass. And in this case, I think it's a biological transference because it's transferring from the organism directly into the um, plant. Next slide. Okay. Oh, and I've got one more question. What are the four different types of microorganisms? June says bacteria, fungi, protozoa, algae. Those are four microorganisms. Thank you, Jan. And that's first three questions, first three people, four people. Um,
So tomorrow, now this could change. <laughs> I don't know, did any of you guys uh, shovel your sidewalks this morning? That's quite a pile of snow. Um, They said it would snow about 26 centimeters or 24 centimeters. And it looks like it really was uh, maybe even more than that. Um, so I can understand if labs are canceled tomorrow and we'll just watch the news and watch our DC mail, see what the status of our lab is tomorrow morning. Um, I started shoveling my sidewalk today and I didn't get more than maybe 20%. So I'm happy I didn't have to uh, rely on my shoveling this morning to get out of the house because I'd still be stuck here. Um, this morning at 7.30, there was an announcement that the campus was open. And then at around quarter after nine this morning, um, announcement that the campus was closed. So if you're traveling from far away, Toronto, uh, Lindsay, Peterborough, um, I don't know if I'd expect you in lab tomorrow at all because the roads would probably be very bad. Um, if you're living on campus or close to campus, you might watch the, uh, watch the emails first thing in the morning, see if there's going to be a lab or not. So um, I suspect that I'll make an announcement either this afternoon by 4.30 or so, or early tomorrow morning to find out. Um, and totally understandable if you don't make it tomorrow. Um, since the first lab is kind of an important lab, I'm going to email another person on campus and see if I can't maybe just hold it back one week because maybe it's safer to have a lab next week as opposed to start off tomorrow. Um, so it may be the case that I'll just make the decision tonight and make cancel labs. So in that case, I'll email everybody, but uh, let me just talk to somebody at the college first. Okay, so um, normally, first day of lab, you need a blue micro lab coat from the bookstore and you need the NCR book. And you keep those things in the um, lab for the entire semester. And Matthew's got a question, so no lab tomorrow. And, um, it's, I don't know yet. So check the email tonight and make So just to everybody, check your email tonight, make sure just to see if uh, there's going to be a lab tomorrow. I'll do my best to make that decision today. Um, I did not hear back on whether or not we have um, lockers available to us. Has anybody heard if lockers are available to you guys on the main campus? Ah, Sebastian's got a question. So he says, um, in the first week, I have uh, mentioned that in the lab manual, there are some guidelines. And no, it's, it's quite well related because it's about lab. Um, I have not posted the
I have not posted the lab manual online yet. Uh, I will post the lab manual later. Uh, I'll say soon. If I can do it during class today, maybe I'll do that. So the instructions for lab, don't bring a backpack or code into the lab. Um, there's no space for all 15 of you that come to lab to package your coats into the lab. It's safer to walk around if there's no lab coats in lab. Um, and the reason we don't want backpacks in the lab is because we don't want anything on the floors to, because the room is tight to kind of walk around in. So if you have, everybody was, if you can imagine, everybody's got their lab coats or their coats and their backpacks and they leave them on the floor. What ends up happening is it becomes a trip hazard. And uh, I know of one faculty member who has had a broken arm on account of tripping over uh, backpacks in the lab. So please um, make sure you don't have, or you can find a place for your stuff to store. Uh, Elliot's got a question. Considering how we have to show proof of vaccination, will we be allowed to keep cell phones? Um, keep them in your pockets and just keep them off. The only place you have to show your cell phone is at the front door so that you can get into onto campus. Um, If you come up by car, you can leave your backpack in your car, or just take what you need, the NCR paper and a pen or pencil that you're willing to give up for the, for the class. Um, there are entrance arrows. Once you come to the first door, it's A206, and the narrow points that you go in through one door, out the other door. We try to just keep the circulation in one direction that way when we're cleaning up the door handles at the end of class we know which ones to disinfect more um, and upon entering disinfect your hands so when you come in there'll be a location for everybody to pick up a mask so you come in you grab a mask with uh, tongs um, after your hands are disinfected, disinfect your hands, put a secondary mask on top of your mask, and then go and wash your hands. Uh, get such your stuff at your de desk, decontaminate it, then wash your hands. I should say that first. So one more time. Process to come into the lab, you walk in, disinfect your hands, put on a mask, put your stuff down at the uh, disinfected desk, put your stuff down on the desk, Go wash your hands and then you're ready for lab. And I've written it down to help me so I know what to do. <laughs> Upon entering, disinfect your hands, keep on your personal mask and put on a new mask. Select a bench, disinfect it, wash your hands, disinfect the bench before and wash your hands before leaving. And when you're leaving, also discard your secondary mask into the trash. Everybody will be getting a secondary mask when you come into lab. Um, you're not supposed to have cell phones in lab, but it's understood you may have it in your pocket. Just keep it off, please. That's the safest thing to do. <laughs> okay, so today's lab is on prokaryotes and archaea. Um, then there's some questions about prokaryotes and then eukaryotes and uh, questions about eukaryotes. Then we'll talk a little bit about the microscope. That's today's lecture. Prokaryotes, archaea, eukaryotes, structures of eukaryotic cells, and then some staining uh, microscope questions. So here's a tree of life picture. Um, there are, like I was saying last time, three domains of life. There's your bacteria domain, archaea domain, and eukaryote domain. These three domains are separated by their um, 
in a molecular manner. So at some point in an ancient history, they may have kind of had some commonality, but at some point they diverged and we have three main branches to the tree of life. Um, question is, where are we? So we are multicellular organisms referred to as eukaryotes and we fit on the third branch at the very, very tip of the third branch. So we're in the kingdom, uh, what is referred to as a kingdom at one point as animals. Oh, okay. So next slide, we have the phylogenics. Like I said, there's three domains of life and scientists organize the three domains based on ribosomes. The ribosomes are used to copy DNA. They're also used to um, translate DNA into proteins. So they have different functions. Um, archaea have one type of ribosome. This is uh, referred to as one of the earliest forms of life. They think it's really maybe even earlier than bacteria because the um, lifestyle of some pro archaea is really very harsh. And so because they suspect that these organisms that lived in extreme environments and survive in extreme environments, maybe they're descendants of the very first organisms that may have lived on light on the earth. Um, bacteria, there, there's two words to them. One word is it's prokaryotic. Prokaryotic means that it has no nucleus where the DNA that makes up the chromosome of the organism is located. So that's the difference between the archaea and bacteria and eukaryote. Eukaryotes do have a nucleus, and so we'll mention that in a second. Um, bacteria are also microscopic. Eukarya are much larger than your prokaryotes. Typically, the smallest eukaryote is 10 times larger. Um, the cells are way more complicated and eukaryotes come in single cells like algae, uh, protozoas that you would see in swimming around in water, all the way to us because we are the largest of the eukaryotes. The word prokaryote I've used just a moment ago. This word comes off uh, two different words. Um, pro in this case means not for, but uh, before, like something be previously. And the word karyot. Um, is based on a Greek word, carrion, and this carrion comes from the word seed or kernel in Greek. And this is because prokaryotes do not have a nucleus. It's before the cell had a nucleus. And so it's why it's called a prokaryote. Um, all of the material inside of the prokaryote are, in, uh, are water soluble in the cytoplasm. Um, I say water soluble, but they could have some sugars, fats that are insoluble that the cell may have made. Um, it's relocated in what's referred to as the cytoplasm. Cytoplasm's gooey jelly-like substance and cytoplasm is what is like the bag of water that holds everything including enzymes, salts, organic molecules, 
and the cytoplasm is bound by what's referred to as a cell membrane. The cell membrane surrounds the cytoplasm and the structure of the cytoplasm is phospholipid. So if you think of uh, a string being a lipid or a fat molecule, then it's called a phospholipid because the one end of the lipid has a phosphate group on it. And so what happens is the phosphates form a polar outer layer and they all kind of line up to form a cell wall. So here is the bacteria structure of um, a simple bacterial cell. This is kind of like what an E. coli cell may look like. We have on the outside, what's referred to as the capsule. The capsule may or may not be there. It depends on the bacteria. Some bacteria do not have capsules, some do. There's a cell wall. This holds in the cytoplasm. All bacteria have a cell wall, but the structure of the cell wall is different between different bacteria. Um, we have the cell wall, plasma membrane, and then the liquidy stuff, the gooey jelly stuff in this inside is referred to as the cytoplasm. It's a liquid in material that holds your salts, sugars, fats. Um, oops. In the case of some bacteria, they have what's referred to as a flagella. And the flagella is a long whip-like structure and it can help microbes move. Inside of this picture, you can see ribosomes. The ribosomes are labeled and the ribosomes are structures that are used to produce proteins or in fact, also make more DNA. Um, the area where the chromosome is located with the structure of the DNA, that's referred to as the nucleoid. Um, the coding that may or may not exist in some of these microbes can also be called the glycocalyx carbohydrate coat. I have one last thing there called inclusions. So sometimes proteins aggregate inside of the cell and that could also be part of the cell. And Robert's got a question, what doesn't have a nucleus again? If it's a prokaryote, they, they have no nucleus. The, their chromosome may be referred as a nucleoid region. Um, it may be referred to as nucleoid, but it's not necessary to be referred to as a nucleoid. So prokaryotes don't have the nucleus, eukaryotes have a nucleus. And Hamish has a great question. What's the purpose of a flagellum? Oh, yeah. Uh, why would it have this? And um, some bacteria, what they do is they live on layers and they develop structures. So they're like building up when they're building more and more of themselves, layering more bacteria upon more bacteria upon more bacteria. Uh, when they do this, that's referred to as a um, lifestyle that sits on something. That's a sessile organism. Sessile, you don't have to know this.
I'm typing out sessile organisms sit on their chosen surface. Um, and then motile or organisms swim. If you can think of an organism that needs to swim, uh, E. coli push themselves around by having these flagella that help them swim. Um, it's not necessary for the, a bacteria to have flagella. They could have cilia or pili, and I have little arrows pointing to the pili in this slide. Um, Spermatozoa have a tail, like a, they have a large tail, which is part of the structure, right? Um, one organism that it does not have a flagella are the corkscrew-like organisms like Lyme disease. They swim by just rotating themselves around and uh, they corkscrew through the water backwards or forwards. So motility is done in a couple of different ways. And Natalie, yep, that would be a similar form of tra transportation. Okay, so that's the slide there. Um, question for you guys. I have selected a red spotlight to kind of point at things. Can you see this when I have it right there set on the green part of the flagella? Daniel says yes. Oh, okay. So you can kind of see me pointing. <laughs> Good. I was wondering about that. Wasn't sure if I had to click to make it visible or if I just had it visible there. So it's visible. Good. Okay. So here are some shapes of bacteria. And like I was saying, some bacteria, they form layers and build upon themselves. So you can see this cluster of um, what was that eight, nine, ten, ten caucus shaped bacteria. They form kind of a cluster. And in fact, the word staphy is related to the word grape. So that's why this group of organisms are referred to as staphylococci because they look like grapes and they're in a caucus shape. Caucus shape, you'll remember, are like a sphere shape. Um, if there's two cocci together, we can call it a diplococci organism. Um, this one here has a capsule. So I think that's Pseudomonas. Pseudomonas is a diploid or a diplococcus with a capsule. Over here on the left, there's a streptococci. Streptococci are bacteria that form chains and the word strepto refers to this chain-like shape. So we have staphylococcus, which are these grape-like shapes and streptococcus, which are like chain-like shapes and grape-like shapes. Now underneath there's a section called bacillus. The bacillus are rod shaped. And here's just one bacilli to, in the center here. Um, two of them would be a diplobacilli. And if you have a chain of them, it would be a streptobacilli. Some microbes, bacteria, uh, what they do is they have a stalk I'm trying to remember the name of this organism that has a stock like this. Uh, it's a slime mold and the name escapes me at the moment. What it does is it has a body, it has grows this stock. And once the stock gets big enough, it makes other organisms that are similar to it. And it just kind of grows like a field of flowers almost. And they, 
move with the help of their stocks. Um, yeast have a hyphae, um, but yeast aren't the only organism with the hyphae. There's also strep, um, streptomycetes. Streptomycetes also send out organ, uh, hyphae strands. They live in dirt and what they do is they cover the dirt or they live in the dirt and they just kind of form this hyphae mesh um, everywhere in all directions. Very complicated organism for bacteria to have such a structured lifestyle. And there's other kinds of shapes. Um, you see Vibrio, which comes from cholera, is a comma-shaped organism. And here's a Vibrio, which is a, and I guess it's not a Vibrio, it's a, it looks like a, I can't read that, it's not large enough for me. I should have put this on a bigger screen. Uh, so I'm stuck right there at the moment. What is the name? I don't know, <laughs> but they have a little tail. So it's got a comma with a tail. Uh, next underneath, you can see a helical form. So the name for this one is Helicobacter pylori. The helico refers to the helical organization of its cell. Bacter kind of refers to like it's a like a rod, but not quite a rod. So it's a helicobacter and the pylori. Remember, this is an organism that causes ulcers in the stomach. Here's the cause of Lyme disease, Borrelia burgdorferia. This is a corkscrew. And like I said earlier, some organisms um, swim with this corkscrew shape. Here's a spirochete called a, it could, this could be like a treponema corkscrew shape organism. There are lots of these corkscrew shapes and oftentimes they're nasty bacteria <laughs> that cause disease. Um, okay, so that's some bacteria and their shapes. We can find bacteria or uh, prokaryotes in almost everywhere on Earth. So if you take a look at the pressure of a place, whether the pressure is like almost no pressure, like in air, uh, you can find bacteria kind of floating around in the air. Um, if they're at standard temperature and pressure in a room, you'll find lots of bacteria there. But even under intense pressure, like a thousand times that, uh, and where would you find that? At the bottom of the ocean floor. So you can find bacteria and archaea in these extreme environments. Also in extreme pH environments, extreme ends of the uh, salinity, be, meaning how salty an area is. So it can go from no salt all the way up to 35% salt, which is like a salt lake. And if you've ever traveled to Saskatchewan, there, there are some salt lake spas in Saskatchewan. Uh, there's also the Dead Sea in the Middle East or Salt Lake City has a salt lake next to it in Utah. So there's lots of different places that have these saline environments. Um, there's also extreme temperature environments. So down to really cold, negative temperatures and even boiling temperatures. Like, so there's a range between maybe minus 50 to as high as 150 degrees Celsius. I'm just gonna move this over. Um, I don't know if you heard, there's a lake at the bottom of uh, 
the Antarctic ice sheet called Lake Vostok. And this is kind of being coming famous because just a year or two ago, uh, Arctic ex Antarctic explorers were digging through and it took them several years to dig a hole several kilometers down and dip into the lake that was at the bottom of this glacier. And they find there are organisms living that have probably been isolated from people and everything for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of years. So these organisms are still at the bottom of the glaciers. Next picture that I have there are um, just a fun kind of notice. Termites have a very interesting community of organisms that live within their uh, intestinal tract. And why do they have these organisms? Well, what they do is they harvest plants, but they need to break down the plants. So they need to break down compounds referred to as lignins or cellulose or pectin. And what they do is they um, secrete or spit up uh, particles that if they've chewed and the microbes in their spit or saliva help them degrade the wood. So the wood gets degraded by either bacteria, archaea or fungi and uh, the termites, they live off of the microbes that way. Okay, next slide. And this just goes to my microbes living in harsh environments again. So they can live in permafrost, referred to as cold seeps, vol volcanoes, they can live by the bottom of the ocean hydrothermal vents or even by hot springs or volcanoes. If you've ever been to Wyoming, there's the uh, Yellowstone National Park where there's hot springs. Um, if you ever go there, be careful. The water is at 100 degrees Celsius. They look really beautiful and colorful because the microbes form these stunning colorful layers, but uh, some of these regions are salt and um, if you step on it, it can crack <laughs> and uh, tourists are known to have died in these extreme environments because the water is at boiling temperatures. Um, so there's interesting geology in places like Wyoming and Iceland, but it's also kind of dangerous too. Um, some of our molecular biology tools come from organisms that we collect from these places. For example, there's this uh, process that we use to amplify or copy DNA and to copy DNA, we need some sort of enzyme to go along the DNA, read it, copy it, and make more of it. And that's a polymerase. And it's referred to, uh, that it, it comes from a organism that we call thermoaquaticus. And that's why we call it a TAC polymerase is because it comes from the thermoaquaticus microbe. Anyway, so we have, uh, the hot springs, we have acidic lakes. So there's all kinds of extreme environments. So like I was saying, microbes live in a very diverse environment and it's more diverse than for eukaryotes. And there's many different kinds of prokaryotic types. They can even use photosyn photosynthesis. Um, just the same way that eukaryotes do. And they can also get energy 
from hydrogen sulfide. So they could be at the bottom of the ocean and extract the energy from the sulfuric compounds. So that's the bacteria and archaea trees of life, those two branches. Now let's take a look at the archaea. Archaea comes from the Greek word archaea, which means ancient things. Um, so the first organisms that were examined as archaea were methanogens. And we think that methanogens are very similar to what was on the earth when the earth was a very primitive planet. Um, so that's why we're thinking that um, archaea are very primitive it's because they can survive a methanotrophic environment. Um, when you compare archaea and bacteria under a microscope, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference because they're the same size and shape. Some archaea are unusual shape, but so far there is no pathogenic archaea. So our focus has not been on archaea too much because they survive in the environment and they um, do their own thing. They can be part of the human and plant microbiome. Um, there is one interesting difference, and that is the enzymes that archaea have are very similar to eukaryotic enzymes. So this is an, one important distinction that makes the archaea similar to eukaryotes. Um, archaea possess genes and metabolite pathways that are very similar to eukaryotes, which is just what I said. Um, and I wanted to say another thing about the fatty acid structure. Maybe it's on a further slide. Archaea use other energy sources. They can use sugar, ammonia, metals, and hydrogen gas. And like I was saying earlier, uh, we learned about these organisms because of their ability to metabolize hydrogen gas. Um, they are unique. So uh, here's the thing about the structure. They rely on ether lipids in membranes. So if you can, if this comes up again, um, it'll be a question, how or why are ether lipids important? And the importance is that they separate archaea from bacteria because archaea have ether lipids, bacteria don't. <clears throat> Next point, salt tolerant archaea use sunlight and um, some can fix carbon, but we don't know of any species of archaea that does both things, use sunlight as well as fixed carbon. Um, like bacteria, they can reproduce asexually. They can also reproduce by binary fission. Some have been shown to bud out when they reproduce, which is not what bacteria do usually. Typically bacteria are asexual or binary fission producing microbes. Um, but unlike bacteria and eukaryotes, archaea do not form spores. And this is another important difference is that archaea don't have spores, but bacteria may have spores and uh, fungi or eukaryotes may have spores as well. And you can think um, spores like in mushrooms or in other types of fungi, mildew, mold, they form spores. Next. Archaea are numerous in the ocean um, and they are very important with carbon and nitrogen cycles. This is an interesting picture of the 
tectonic plates of Earth. And along the tectonic plates, you have these hydrothermal vents. The hydrothermal vents are where you can find a lot of these organisms. And here's a picture showing some of these wild organisms. Um, so there are these red tube worms found at the bottom of the ocean. Um, there's a whole bunch of snails in this image. Um, on the center image C, this is a shrimp, tons and tons, like a rock covered in shrimp. So archaea can be found in the red tube worms, shrimp, snails, or even what are referred to as black smokers. And they're called black smokers because these hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean, they release sulfuric uh, gases. And these gases instantly react with the liquid and form a black compound. And the black compound moves up because it's a convection current going up. And there's archaea within those clouds, those plume clouds, as well as on the rocks as well. So where it's hot, extremely hot under lots of pressure, um, archaea are found there. Methanogens can live inside of the gut of cows and other um, grass-eating ungulates like goats, deer. Uh, they, methanogens can be isolated from the intestines of animals and they can help produce biogas. The enzymes can endure extreme temperatures like I was saying earlier. And you can even find some salt tolerant microbes in pickles. And these are referred to as halophiles. A uh, halophile is a organism that lives in a halic environment and halic refers to the salty, H-A-L-O, halophile. And uh, we have a question from Hamish. What's a methanogen? Uh, Methanogen, an organism that uses methane. I send that to everybody or just one person? Good question, Hamish. <laughs> Thanks. Um, this is the size of the organism. This is the abundance of the organism. You can have 40 million bacteria cells in a gram of soil. You can have a million bacteria cells in a milliliter of water. So they're very abundant. The point of this slide is they're very, very abundant. And we need them to fix nitrogen. We need them to fix carbon. Um, you can find them as low as 11 kilometers down and inside of rocks, inside of salt crystals. Everywhere you look, you can find microbes. You can even find them in extreme cold, extreme heat, extreme pH, and so on. OK. Back to questions. So, um, Irene, Matthew, Tobich, Cleo, 
Um, and Jiyun, here's a question for you guys. Can you tell me how archaea are different from bacteria? Brooklyn has the answer there that uh, there are these ether lipids that separate archaea from bacteria. That's correct. That's one difference. Archaea don't have spores, that's correct. Um, Hamish, you've sent that to me, but that's for everybody. So I can share that with everyone. Archaea don't have spores. There's maybe two more differences, three more differences. Um, anybody else? Paul says there's no nucleus. That's correct, Paul. Eukaryotes are the ones that have the nucleus. Natalie says flagella. Um, which one have the flagella? Do they have, archaea have flagella? I know that um, Escherichia coli have flagella and that's a bacteria. So I was expecting bacteria might have the flagella. Sebastian says bacteria can have cilia, flagella, and pili. That's correct. <laughs> okay. Um, and here's one further one. Archaea are not pathogenic. Thanks, Irene. And that's correct. They are not pathogenic. There are at least no pathogenic uh, archaea have been found yet. Um, what can I add to that? Oh, yeah. The enzymes for the archaea seem direct a closer relation to eukaryotes than they are um, related to bacteria. Okay, so that's that question. Uh, how are archaea similar to bacteria? Do I want to do an upstall? Sorry. Um, how are archaea similar to bacteria? They are the same, same what? Thank you. Danielle's got the answer there. They don't, 
um, they are similar in size and shape. Okay, next question. What are four structures found in or on a bacterial cell? ribosomes. This is in the bacterial cell, that's correct. Cytoplasm in the cell, correct. Cell wall, yes. Okay, thanks everyone. There's, there's four answers that are correct, or three, three answers that are correct. Next slide or question. What are four shapes commonly observed in bacteria? Um, I'll leave that spiral, spheres, and rods, according to Amanda. Thank you, Amanda. And Sebastian's got comma, cocci, bacilli, corkscrew. Yep, excellent. Those are the four most common shapes. All right, carry on with the next slide. So now let's take a look at eukaryotes, and then we'll end off with the microscope information. So eukaryotes. Here's a eukaryotic cell. <laughs> There's a lot more stuff going on in here. Let's just go down the list. Found in eukaryotic cells. So the eukaryotic cells have a different cell membrane. They have, um, other than plants, plants have cell walls. They have cell membranes. So let's take a look. Where's the cell membrane here? Uh, I see cell coat and I see plasma membrane. So these two structures are part of the cell. Next, cytoplasm. Uh, you will recall the cytoplasm is inside of the bacteria as well. So the cytoplasm is your liquid jelly kind of material that holds everything in place. This is the major difference right here for eukaryotes and bacteria. Um, a nucleus is located in a eukaryotic cell. So here's a nucleus. It's kind of a sphere in the center and the chromosome for the organism is located in the nucleus, nucleolus of the uh, nucleus. So there's material called chromatin around that, and then there's the nucleolus, but it, they have a nucleus, a proper nucleus. Um, ribosomes are found in eukaryotes as well. They just have a different structured ribosome than bacteria. And the ribosomes are do have a picture of where the ribosome is located. Ah, here we are. Ribosome is on the surface of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So this is the area where the eukaryotic cell is making its proteins. Next, not found in bacterial cells is a structure that is called a lysosome. So this area right there, the blue circular area is help, uh, breaks down compounds. Inside of a eukaryotic cell, we also have the mitochondria. Mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell. They're usually like a kidney bean shape or, um, and they generate the power of the cell. There's a area called the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, this is going to take the proteins that are made and then 
the proteins are modified as structurally in the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, and so that's the points of what is found in your eukaryotic cell. Now, here's a plant cell, and inside of the plant cell, you have slightly different structures, and the two main differences I've highlighted here are the chloroplasts and the cell wall. The chloroplasts, uh, let's see if I can locate a uh, chloroplast. Here is one, number nine, organelle containing thiolite thylakoids, um, the sites of photosynthesis. So these tiny little structures are what are making the plant form uh, the green material. They, they take the energy of the sun and they convert it into um, their sugars inside of the plant. That process is known as photosynthesis. So they take in carbon dioxide, break it apart uh, and, and alter it through the thylakoids by photosynthesis. So the energy of the sun helps them form the five membered rings of sugars. And what do they do with these sugars? Well, they can form the cell walls out of cellulose and that's made up of, um, a variety of hemicellulose uh, sugar carbon compounds. So plants are capable of taking carbon dioxide air and converting that into sugars and uh, cellulose. What uh, things are made of cellulose? Uh, our clothes, if it's cotton, they're cellulose, paper. Like if you have a piece of paper, totally made of cellulose. Um, so these bacteria and plants are all good at making cellulose. Oh, somehow I've moved. Sorry. I really jumped ahead. I don't know what happened. Something must have gotten touched. Um, okay, so there are three kinds of eukaryotic microbes, fungi, protozoa, and algae. And for fungi, we have yeast and molds. So with fungi, in this category, we have uh, yeast, and there's also mold. Um, When we talk about fungi, we talk about sapro or saprophytes. What they do is they attach um, themselves to dead organic matter and they take the energy out of that uh, and nutrients are formed from, from decomposition. So if you think, how is this like yeast? Well, yeast are found on the surface of your fruits and they take the sugars, fructoses from the uh, plant and they convert that into alcohol. Um, fungi don't carry out photosynthesis, but they do recycle material. So they take plants, break it down, and we have different material from that. Okay, what is a mold? A mold is a filamentous organism. Filaments are these kind of structures that it form out. Um, and if you think of bread mold or mold from anything from the back of the fridge that you might have pulled out and said, oh, how old is this? And you see the white pithy kind of surface to it, that'd be a filamentous growth to the organism. Um, yeast are much more complicated than bacteria. And they have other kinds of uh, descriptors based on the shapes of their cells. And there's some sh uh, shapes are interesting. Um, like 
yeast will have these oval shapes and they'll bud out and other yeast can have filament. Um, it depends on the microbe. <clears throat> um, there's also for molds, the growth of these filamentous growth areas is referred to as mycelial, interwoven mycelial growth. Um, what they do is they can also form spores at this mycelial stage. And this is why it's important to clean off mold is because you don't want the spores to spread in the air. Next slide, yeast. Um, most yeast are non-filamentous, but I suspect some do form hyphae. Uh, I'll have to look that up, I guess. Do yeast form hyphae? Some strange reason I want to say yes. Okay, so typically yeast will form a round shape and produced by popping off a small oval referred to in a process as budding. They're bigger than bacteria, but they're very simple when compared to something like a mold. The mold being this uh, filamentous growth with almost like a pattern to it. If you've seen uh, some molds, they have like a concentric colored pattern, whereas yeast will just kind of be uniforming uh, layer of growth. Um, yeast are found in fruits and on leaves, they're found uh, on plants mostly. Um, and we use yeast to make food. Protozoa are the small little organisms that you might find in a drop of water. And they can be all different shapes, sizes. Um, one of them could be like a, an amoeba. An amoeba is a protozoa. It doesn't have a structure to it and it's very motile. It just kind of oozes out its arms to in order to travel. Uh, another microbe is an algae. Algae have chloroplasts that form photosynthesis, but they don't have roots or leaves, but they're just little tiny microbes that have all of the uh, ability of a plant to create sugars and energy based on taking the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and converting that into the complex carbohydrates that it utilizes. That's an algae. Here's an example of a prokaryotic cell next to a eukaryotic cell. You can see there are similarities and this is a great test question. So this is a good question to, or picture to kind of focus on if you're studying later. Uh, prokaryotic cells are tinier than eukaryotic cells. Um, both have a plasma membrane, both have cytoplasm, DNA, and both have ribosomes. The difference between them in this image is that in bacteria, they have a re nucleoid region. So this area in the center is where the chromosome is located. In eukaryotes, the chromosome is located directly in a nucleus. Okay, so that's the difference between a prokaryotic cell almost what is the same between a prokaryotic cell and eukaryotic cell, as well as two differences. So there's the size difference, as well as the nucleus versus nucleic, nucleoid region difference. Here's a bigger picture of things that are the same and things that are different. Eukaryotes, like I said, are bigger. They have a membrane bound nucleus and Inside, they have these appendages that are complicated, like the uh, 
lysome, um, liposome, endoplasmic reticulum, ribosome, the uh, kidney-shaped mitochondria. These are complicated structures that are in the eukaryotes. Um, DNA in eukaryotes are typically linear. Um, and what happens is there are proteins called histones. DNA wraps around histones and they form these tight spirals and they kind of bunch up into the uh, nuclear material inside of a nucleus. They divide by mitosis. They have a cell wall and that's a simple cell wall. Prokaryotes are smaller. They don't have a bound nucleoid region. Um, so this slide shows what's the same and what's different. So other differences, they have simple appendages, not the complex appendage like the mitochondria. Um, prokaryotes often have circular DNA. This is not always the case. Sometimes they have linear DNA, but it's not tightly wound in the same way. Um, they separate by binary fission. There's no membrane receptors. No membrane receptors, really. I, I'm kind of hesitant with this. There are membrane signaling proteins. Maybe the person that made the slide has a different intention. Anyway, so let's carry on. The cell walls are a little different and there's no cytoskeleton to a prokaryote where there is a cytoskeleton to a eukaryotic cell. Then what can be the same? Both could have flagella, both could have a plasma membrane. They both undergo cell division somehow. They both have cytoplasms, ribosomes, chromosomes. Okay, time for the questions. Anybody in class, go ahead. <laughs> what are four structures common to both eukarya and bacteria? I can just go back a slide, look in the center. What are the four things that are the same between bacteria and eukarya? Natalie's got one, that's right. Adam's got another, and Danielle has a third. So thank you. We've got the ribosomes, cell membrane. Cytoplasm, cell membrane, flagella could be the same. Correct. Okay. What is the most important difference between bacteria and eukaryotes? The one, number one big difference. And Sebastian's got that too. Thanks, Sebastian. Okay, so. Uh, I've got 20 minutes left to talk about microscopy. Um, so I looked at the new lab manual. And the new lab manual has uh, an area for the lab where we talk about safety of the lab. We talk about um, the components of the lab, where's the exits, Where's the wash up area? Where are the fire extinguishers? Who do you call in case of an emergency? That sort of thing. Um, and then there's the second part of the lab, which is the microscopy. What is a microscope? What are the parts of a microscope? Um, what's the nose piece? What is the coarse 
adjustment, what is the fine adjustment, and what is it like to look at a slide under the microscope. So that's the first lab is it's going to be where, what are the thing parts of the lab, answer a couple of questions as to what is in the lab, and then the last part is um, a microscope. What do you see as a, from a microscope slide? Um, this topic also talked about a little bit about dilutions. Hopefully by the end of today, I will also have a, an assignment for you guys, um, just a metric review. We can, I'll, I'll post that after lecture today. Um, so right down here, post assignment one for today. And it'll be, like I said, a review on the metric system. Um, mostly the size of things being milliliters, microliters, liters, or distance, meters, micrometers, centimeters, that sort of thing. Um, so in a microscope, if you can, I'll back up. If you have a Petri dish and you can see on the Petri dish, a dot. This is referred to as a colony of bacteria. Uh, colonies of bacteria can be different colors, it can be different shapes, and they can be anywhere from less than a millimeter across to 10 centimeters or larger. So here's a petri dish, and if you take a look, in the center I've placed a bit of fungus and What I've also done is I've streaked out some bacteria. So this bacteria is a very pure culture. The fungus is a very, very pure culture. And I've spread the bacteria out on the plate. Um, and what happens with these individual is the fungus that's in the center of the plate, you can see kind of like a concentric circles. This isn't a very good example, but uh, sometimes it's very, very, very clear that close to the fungal spot, spores have kind of jumped off and formed and they're growing around. So the fungus are growing around the very central plug. Um, bacteria from this massive struck out region, they've been struck out as individual colonies. And when they grow like that, um, when they're very close together, they sh form small colonies, but when they're individuals, they're allowed to grow larger and they form larger colonies. These colonies can be anywhere from up to a centimeter across. The fungus uh, you can see is just in less than a millimeter across. So depending on the kind of shape it has, you can say it's punctiform, punctiform being little tiny dots, circular being kind of bigger dots. So there's punctiform, circular dots. There's no filamentous stuff on this plate, but there are irregular shapes in a curled concentric manner. So you can see some of these are kind of curly and they also have a concentric kind of a center body. And you can even describe them by their elevation, whether they're flat, round, raised, convex. So there's lots of different ways of describing these. Next slide. If you look at, so I'll go back. If you take a specialized stick that we use in the microscope lab, um, and we pick up some of this bacteria material, put it onto a glass slide and look at that underneath the microscope, then this is what you'll see under the microscope. You'll see if it's a pure colony, maybe um, rods. If it's a mixed colony, maybe rods and spheres. And that's the case, what looks like in this case, rods and spheres. 
each of these individuals are called cells. Cells are small, they're clear, they come in different shapes. And here are the bacteria shapes. You remember there's the cocca shapes, which are like grapes. And on this slide, they don't look like spheres, they look more like bars. So they look more like the bacilli. Some of them have two bacilli together. So they'd be like maybe a streptobacilli or a diplobacilli. I don't see any in long chains, but some are indefinitely uh, maybe two together. So they come in different shapes and sizes of what, and that's what you see under the microscope. So simple staining is used to increase background. Um, the steps are you heat fix your organism to the slide. To do that, you put some bacteria from a loop onto a slide, heat, heat that over um, a flame, and then you stain that for one to 10 minutes, and then you wash the stain off with distilled water. Then you look at it through the microscope. And you can see in this slide, Um, on the left-hand side, if it looks like a really dense, hard to see through mass, that means you've not spread the bacteria out very well. You've put too much down. If you have nicely spread out bacteria, you can see these nicer spread out images. Um, the color of the staining depends on the chemicals you use to stain the bacteria. Because it's very hard to see something so small, that's why we use stain to bring out the shape so we can look at it a little better. Typically, we kill the organism with the heat and because uh, we don't want to spread the bacteria in any way. So we kill the bacteria, we stain it, and then we look at it. But because we stained it, it might be that we see things that aren't part of the bacteria that are part of the stain. Sometimes that happens because the stains can get contaminated. They can also crystallize if they're too old. Typically this, that doesn't happen uh, with the stains we have in lab. We use fairly stable, reliable stains. Okay, here's a microscope. Um, here's the eyepiece. There's where you're looking through, um, the table where you'd set the microscope slide down, that's referred to as the stand. The base is the area that you'd set down on the bench top. Um, you have the eyepieces and the lenses. So the eyepieces are where you'd look through with your eyes. In this case, it's a binocular microscope and the lenses are what you would set down on top of the um, slide. So if let's say this is the lens that's pointing down, you put a microscope slide down and you'd raise it up with the crank till it, till it gets into focus and then you set it there and then you go to a higher magnification And with the higher, like it'd be the bigger lens, then with the higher magnification, you'd kind of adjust the focus up and down. So if you take a look at the crank here, there's two knobs. There's a coarse adjustment and on the inside, fine adjustment. At the beginning, you'll start at the lowest setting, adjust the coarse knob, and then adjust the, um, lens to a higher power and then use the fine tuning at a higher power. So this is a microscope. So welcome to the microscope. What do we have here? I have 
microscope uses visible light. There are microscopes that use um, infrared, but we're using invisible light. Uh, in this case, there's three lenses. The microscopes in our lab for microbiology have four. Um, there's an ocular or four powers of lenses. This is also talking about what kind of lenses there are. There's the eyepiece, that's the ocular lens. That magnifies it 10 times. There's the objective lens that magnifies the what you're looking. So the ocular is up on top here. The objective is at the bottom. And then there's a condenser lens. And what that does is it takes the light and shines it into a direct path onto your sample. <clears throat> There are ways to improve the uh, resolution and contrast by adjusting maybe the dimmer switch right there, makes the light dimmer or darker. Also, there's an aperture here that if you slide it across, allows you to condense light to a point. Um, it's good to, uh, to highlight a spot if you're looking at a higher magnification. Okay. And this talks about the total magnification. Now I have five minutes. Um, I'm just going to go through this quickly. Sorry. Why do we use a stain with microscope? Um, anybody care to answer? What's the point of using a stain? Visibility, yes. What it'll do is it'll stay on the organism so you can see it better. And you'll wash it off so the background will be clear, but the organism will retain the stain. What is a microbiological, what is a microbial colony? Yes, it's a group of organisms, group of microbes. Um, typically in a standard dot like that, there's a, anywhere from a million to billions of microbes. <clears throat> in order to see your microbes by eye, that's what you need to do is you need to grow colonies. Okay, at the beginning of class, somebody asked, where's the lab? <laughs> so here we are. Here's the bus loop out in front of the college. Uh, I have this photo that I took last year, kind of around this time. Um, as you see the bus loop at the front entrance, it has the front entrance is this area with behind this connect circle. This, I think that it looks like a Stargate. <laughs> it's a sculpture public sculpture that um, is the kind of a logo for the college. And if you have to go to um, the security or any sort of administration, like at the front desk of the college, that's right at this point right there. But for our class and for our purposes, the structure right here, this is the door you'll wanna go into. Um, it's the A wing or the I wing. Both, I think the A wing is on the first level. The I wing is second floor. So you go th through these doors on the right hand side of uh, the bus stop. That'd be the north kind of side of the bus stop, not the south side. And then go through the doors. This is what you'll see. You'll see there's a security guard and you'll show your cell phone that'll say that you um, are approved for access to the college, uh, college. And he'll say, go ahead, 
sanitize your hands and then you go up the stairs turn left and that's where the lab is so this main entrance the i-wing entrance past the doorman up the stairs to the left um, that's where the lab is if you want to go to the bookstore instead of going up the stairs turn left down the hall that's the bookstore if you have to use the washroom there's the washroom right in front of the uh, security guard every year there's a question where's the washroom um, i'm not sure where the ladies washroom is there's a men's washroom right at the end of the hallway right across from the microbiology lab uh, ladies i think that's the closest washroom for you here okay and do we have lab tomorrow? Um, I'll have to get back to you guys. It'll, I'll make an email announcement. Do we have lab or not? But that's it for class. Ah, I made it to the end of class. Yep, that's it. So today was the microbe morphology and environments and an introduction. Okay, guys, uh, folks, everyone, I'll take questions if you guys have any more. Any other questions? Uh, like I said, I'll update you on whether or not there's a lab tomorrow due to the weather. It might be canceled. We'll see. Um, and I'll stay online in case anybody has any other questions. Amy, no problem. Neil, Hamish, thanks for class, guys. Uh, thanks for your participation and answering the questions. To Jan, Hamish, Cassandra, Ari, Matthew, Tabachku, I asked questions, you ended responded. Thank you. That's exactly what I needed or wanted. Thanks. Um, hopefully we'll see you tomorrow. And like I said, I don't know. <laughs> um, I see there's only a few guests of left, Brooklyn, Cass, Jen, Tabuchukwu. Any questions, guys? Just ah, Jen, see you tomorrow. Cheers. And Cass, you're the last one in. Um, any questions? Well, thanks everyone. I think that's it for class today. I will end the session now. Like I said, hopefully we have lab tomorrow, but we'll see. <laughs> good night and or have a good day. Good luck with the rest of your day. Take care of the, uh, yourself with the snow. Cheers. Talk to you later. Bye.